The condition is really crazy condition. And that shouldn't give away the whole secret to professional winter. Matei Yakino giving up to our power off his body. Here we go. What a finish. The guy is kind of talking bullshit. The team has just got to work a little harder. Welcome to the Windsurfing Podcast, back again for episode six. And this week we have a crazy Frenchman, not big in stature, but big in the balls department, I can tell you that. Uh, he is the original storm chaser. He's won the event a couple of times. Uh, and we, well, Matchek finds out that he has spent over six hours a day sometimes searching through Google Earth, trying to find the best windsurfing spots possible. Uh, he also finds out about some pretty drunken antics, including crashing his van, racing shopping carts. And we also hear about travels and why you shouldn't trust the locals. Who is it? Well, if you haven't guessed by now, it's obviously the one and only crazy Frenchman, Thomas Traversa. Thomas, how's it going? Good, and you? Good, good. I have some really tough questions prepared for you. The first one is, nice. I'm, strugg I'm really struggling with my water start. Can you give me some tips? <laughs> struggling with what with my water start um <laughs> oh, i'm joking of course i would say i would say go with the beach start first then <laughs> you know yeah first maybe, thing first maybe i should try that anyway yeah. i heard um you're kind of even though the lockdown sort of is finished you're kind of stuck at home with a little uh injury let's say um what's going on there yeah i had a um, i had a problem with my lung uh nothing really serious but i didn't really identify the problem when it was when it came up so i was like going for a couple of days with this lung problem and then it got a bit bad so i had to go to the hospital and in the end, because of my job and what I do, they, they were a bit scared that can happen again. So they decided um, I had to get a surgery. So yeah, I spent like I think eight eight days in the hospital. But yeah, it's it's fine. And now now the only problem is that I have to take it easy for a couple of weeks, not doing hardcore sport. Like only basically I can only walk. And things like this, but uh, after, yeah, we'll have no, you know, no problem. Like I will work one hundred percent, and yeah, it's life. And actually, I'm lucky, you know, with this uh, special year. As we all know, there's it's a special year that uh, I'm not gonna have any problem with like going to Pozo because I think actually I would have not been able to go to Pozo, for example. So I'm kind of lucky. So I'm grateful to be healthy, alive, and nothing to complain about, actually. Yeah. You seem to get injured kind of quite a lot. I mean, not a lot, but let's say frequently every year, it seems like you have a little, a little something. Uh, I remember, like, I think last year you broke your foot or two years ago, and then and the year before that, yeah, you had yeah. a, um, like a face fracture, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, actually, since like uh, last year in August, no, in July, I've been on a really bad roll. Like, I broke my my toe in Pozo, which is like nothing, but I could not compete anymore. Then I got uh, this uh, kidney stone uh, the day after I won the wave event in Zilt. During the event, but the day after I won the, the waves. Uh, to get surgery and then uh, now this, you know, so yeah, it's been a tough year and yeah, I broke my face in 2006, 2016, but this was because I was just like uh, super drunk and I passed out, so nothing similar. So, yeah, yeah, so how many, how many of those things are actually on the water? Because me, every time I get injured, there's nothing is nothing uh, with windsurfing. Last time I dropped, I the the quiver was obviously fucking heavy, 
and it was dropping from the cart and I tried to catch it and uh, the thumb just went to the other side and I broke the ligaments. <laughs> so things like this. So you, how many, <laughs> how many of this is? Uh, yeah. Is well, at, at least the, the toe I broke in Pozo was during my heat. Uh, so this was when something related and before this, I broke my foot the first time in 2008, then second time, end of 2008. So two, two times the same bone in the same year. Then I broke my foot again, another bone, and I had to get surgery in 2012. This was all wind surfing. And then I broke my foot, the other foot, uh, in 2015, also wind surfing. Uh, but uh, yeah, lately the injuries I've been suffering were not wind surfing related which is a bit weird, like you say, you know, we were taking sometimes big, big, not big race, but like we're committing hard, you know, and with our body and, and then, yeah, and then something happens because you do something stupid, like partying or just being unlucky, you know? So yeah, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit weird, but you know, I, I believe that everything happens for a reason somehow. So. <laughs> <laughs> what is, what is the dumbest or funniest? injury you've heard from anyone yourself or anyone like like you know like you say you guys especially you guys in the waves you take big risks i think it's easy to say i mean you're riding massive waves pretty much every every week or you go to pozo and you do stall doubles you land fully flat uh, on your back on your feet on whatever and then uh, guys get injured mostly yeah, in weird ways. So, what is the strangest one you've heard? <laughs> yeah, um, I remember. I remember uh, my good friend Alex, like kind of almost broken, breaking his foot in Cape Verde, like in the rocks, which is kind of stupid, you know. It was not a big day or nothing special. Uh, but I think there are stories like this, but most of the time you don't really know about it. Myself, like you say, I broke my face. This could have been really bad. I was partying. Uh, I think I think there are stories like this around, but we don't really know them. But I think I'm a good good candidate for the most stupid way to enjoy yourself. When I was young, also also get a rather had a really bad injury. I don't know this collarbone. Bone, yeah. yeah, like uh, also like um, going down a hill in. Uh, how you say this shopping cart wheel? Shopping cart, yeah. like, uh, <laughs> yeah. And I still have pain from this. I cannot really do push up because it's like clack clack. And this is like from 15 years ago. So I'm 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 good at self destructing myself with like stupid yeah. behaviors. If you would take super care on the beach, you'd probably have to take super care on the water, right? I mean, it's just your attitude. That goes from everyday life, I think, to towards towards sailing later. I mean, some of the latest stuff you've been posting, the videos. I mean, it's pretty insane what what you've been doing lately. So, do you think it really takes like your yeah. character? You can really see it on the water. Yeah, yeah, but but the difference is, I guess, that when I'm in the water, I'm in the water, I know what I'm doing. But I'm, when I'm drunk and you know, doing a cartwheel race. I'm not really a specialist, so that's why I get more enjoyed in this kind of situation. <laughs> At least in windsurfing, I, I can do something a little bit stupid, or not stupid, but yeah, I'm 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 okay to take risks. But I'm, I I have the feeling I I kind of know what I'm doing. So yeah. you know, did you win? Did you win the cartwheel race? Uh, I was yeah well. I guess, you know, because I got a nice crash. So that was probably the, what you can call winning it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So on the water, I mean, I know you're not really a big fan of like training off the water and physiotherapy and all this kind of stuff. Um, because it is my, my thinking is like, okay, you've been doing all these radical things on the water and talking about injuries a lot of guys take a lot of care so maybe 
to on the beach you know to to prepare themselves for all these kind of situations what's your what's your attitude towards that because i know it's a little bit different maybe than a lot of the guys yeah i i, I think you know uh, i mean we are we all different we are special in a way but i think a lot of people have probably a wrong idea of myself also of me and uh like i i I'm I'm doing a lot of running actually and I've been doing since a long time like biking running so it's not like I'm I'm not preparing myself but I'm only doing what I love it's the same like in windsurfing you know let's say in windsurfing I like going in these different spots and ride ways with novelty around and even if it's not what I should really train for if I want to get a world title I do this and it's the same with my physical preparation like i like running a lot in the in the hill you know like not on the circuit i go in the mountain around my house and this is i can do this every, pretty much every day so in the end i have a good cardio and i have i think i have a good condition physical physical condition but yeah for sure. and also what i know is like i know myself I have, i'm super skinny i've always been like this i'm not a muscly strong guy so in a way i'm like for like thinking a bit like for what you know like why i should like try to become like all these strong guys i'm not gonna become like this you know it's like, like if i if you're asking philip costa to to become skinny and light you know for what the guy is fucking destroying everything the way he is and he you know what i mean so i have a bit yeah. of this approach like i'm i'm i know it's a bit wrong like i I could probably be more prepared and uh I should also. But uh yeah, that's that's what I've been doing and I think it's working. The problem, yeah, the problem is like I'm not so strong, so I think I have more risk to enjoy myself. And for example, if I go to a place like a uh, Pozo, I cannot sail more than two two, three days in a row because after I'm destroyed, you know, my body is not strong enough. So yeah. these kind of places, I cannot, I cannot train. I cannot train. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not strong enough for this. And I guess I, sh I could make more efforts uh, to have my body strong for this kind of sailing. But yeah, we all make choices, you know. In life, you have to, you have to make choices. Yeah, I think what everything. you're, what you're talking about is kind of like you have your identity and you, you maximize in that area. You exactly. cannot do. Yeah. you cannot do everything you cannot because if you become heavier yeah. you probably cannot use your 62 liter and <laughs> everywhere you know anymore and <laughs> and your quiver of yeah. your quiver of four sails that i'm super yeah, exactly excited. i think you use like three three up to four five and that's it no yeah no I, since two years Yes, I have a 3.0 that um, Peter, the designer of Gastra, made for me a prototype. Uh, but before I had 3.3, yeah, and my bigger size is 4.5. So. But even the 3.3, I use almost only in Pozo and sometimes at home, like a couple of times. But basically, so it's like 3.7, 4.0, 4.2, 4.5, like four sales. You can yeah. do everything. Almost, you know? Yeah, five with the 3.3. Three, three. Let's say five sales, yeah yeah and that's that's like you say that's an advantage i like it for sure for sure and how how you why do you think it's like this that when it's 15 knots i'm on a five seven and you are on four five but then when it's 40 knots i'm on three three and you're on three three is that just pure balls or is that skill or is that just somehow physics what, what do you think um i think it's uh it's it's not skills but yeah it's adaptation and physics also i think the you know the stronger the wind the the more we all get close together like in the same sail range you know it makes sense i think yeah because you cannot really go smaller than three three or three or so because it's just not working um yeah, it gets unstable so, no? it gets like 
you cannot really yeah exactly you know there's yeah there's a limit in the, you know the shape of the sail the sail is it's too small it's not reacting well the sail and and also because i'm small i'm used to i've always been sailing overpowered in strong winds you know i'm like if i go in strong wind i try to make a back loop i'm never gonna go up and down like philip does i'm always gonna fly sideways even if i have a mini sail and you know you get used to sail like this and you learn it like this and then and then you can uh yeah you just get used to it and and that's it i think that's uh, also that's a, a big part of it is a bit like being lazy you know I'm, like i don't really like to to have too much equipment to travel with too much equipment and all this thing yeah. i'm a bit like a minimalist in this kind of approach so i yeah it's not skills it's just you get used to it but like like what you say also look at i i like to use the example of philip because he's, he's the polar opposite of myself you know and um it's amazing to see him like in really light winds he's, he's not using such a big sail and he's also using a small ball and a small sail you know and the guy is planing and throwing double in like less than 20 knots with a 5.3 and a 85 liters ball and weighs 100 kilo yeah so yeah you could have, <laughs> yeah, no, for you sure know, it's, you, you it's, know I mean. it's insane to see him like sometimes like like i say you know i would be out with a 5.6 and a 100 liter barely planing and he's with 5.3 and a smaller board and he's probably heavier even than me and like you say yeah. like i can barely get off the ground to do a chop hop and he does doubles so for sure it's um like you say you know you're born with that kind of body and you kind of adapt uh yeah. in a way so it's insane and, it's insane to see have... him in this light stuff and it's insane to see you in in the strong because it's like how you know how the guy does that you know but anyway coming yeah, back to this is something i really go go yeah it's also just to say it's something special about windsurfing i think you know compared to other sports it's like a, it's such a there's such a variety of different styles of sailing and style of people like body body style and uh yeah it's rare you know you don't have so many sports like this but where you can have really different kind of people doing the same thing, uh, sort of. Yeah, I think sort of. I think, uh, gener I mean, generally, probably Philip is an exemption, right? But still, you can have, you can be 85 kilos and you can be 65, probably not a problem. Although certain conditions, for sure, for sure, you feel an advantage and a disadvantage, right? You feel an advantage in silt. You have to feel, I mean you seem just to be on top of all the current and all the chop, you know, where probably in Pozo you feel the opposite way, like uh, holding yeah. the board down and kind of you need to really slalom sail into the bunker to get the ramp, right? And probably yeah. for you, that's that's a disadvantage. So there is that, but as you say, it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, yeah. So coming back to... To what we've been talking about training not training and having a lot of gear and preparing the gear and stuff how do you see your windsurfing more like you see yourself as an athlete like it's a sport or it's more of a lifestyle adventure because there is many ways this is an amazing thing about windsurfing as well there's many ways to to see it right I mean, what what is it for you right now? Yeah, the, yeah, that's that's a good thing that you had right now because right what it is right now, it's not what it was ten years ago and or you know, fifteen years ago. Right now, it's um, it's totally like a adventure lifestyle thing. You know, it's not. I don't. I wouldn't call myself an athlete because I'm not, you know. Uh, I think a lot of people who are like uh, preparing themselves for the local run race, like just a uh, you know, jogging race they do here, they're more serious about their preparation than me. So it would be a bit uh, pretentious to call myself an athlete. 
but so yeah, I see more myself, yeah, the more like uh, um, living, yeah, like searching for different experience, um, yeah, like yeah like uh you know like looking on maps i i think i spend way more time looking at maps and forecast and this kind of thing that thinking about my body and my sailing you know um so like yeah like kind of exploration style you know and also a bit of art i would even if it's a bit cocky also not to call yourself an artist but i always like this kind of thing of like thinking that it's not so much about, uh, um, you know, we, even when we compete, it's judged by human. It's not us in the waves. You, you, you're doing most of this slalom, which is different. There's a clear winner on second, third. But in the waves, it's, it's all a bit different. It's an artistic discipline, you know? Um, we're making a show and uh, it has to be nice to the eye. If you wanna, you know, to be good, you have to look good. The style and there's, it's like a choreography and all this thing. And uh, so, yeah, I always really like this this aspect, you know. For me, I remember the even when I was young, I always focused on trying to make thing, things look easy, you know. Like, uh, I think this is really important. I, I enjoy more watching someone even if it's not that good, but who's doing it with grace and nice, like uh, a thoughtless style than someone maybe better, but who has a fucking ugly style and it's like, uh, muscling through it, you know? That's my, just my taste. I'm talking, yeah. this is not, not, it's not the truth. It's only my opinion. So yeah, I would call myself more like a, a sportsman still because I'm doing sport, but um, more like in the artistic side of sport. I would say, yeah. and and also the exploration of this adventure. Um, you know, the last video I did with my friend from Portugal, I, I I talked about this that in a windsurfing trip, in the end you don't really spend much time windsurfing. Uh, and this is what I've been doing all my whole life. If I'm here right now talking to you. It's because of the windsurfing trips. It's not because of uh, training to do this maneuver or to perform good in competition. So, yeah. Yeah. So you, but you mentioned, but you mentioned that maybe ten years ago it was a little different, right? I mean, I read somewhere that you actually decided to be a full-time pro on a trip to Indonesia, which is probably the furthest from the PWA windsurfing tour uh conditions than it is so you must have realized that there is going to be the aspect of okay to be able to to make a living to do what i want to do i'm gonna have to compete right and i'm gonna have to go through that grind let's yeah. say so how was it yeah. when you started and how how you know how did it evolve yeah, so, yeah, that's why I say it was different before because first, you know, uh, something I think which is really different from my, like, that I had a different experience than most of other pro windsurfers is that uh, I never, I never even wanted to be a pro windsurfer or anything like this, you know, I never really wanted to to compete or um i don't know it was for me what i wanted was just to have a good time and go on a trip with friends and have a good time uh see new places make nice parties you know the freedom the experience and also the adrenaline you get when you ride this is all i was always looking for so in the end, yeah, I realized after, like, through my career that actually if I wanted to keep doing this, I had to compete because if I want to get the money to do it, I have to compete because it's a small sport. I'm not going to be paid just for going to Indo over and over, you know. So if I want to be able to go to Indo, I have to go to Pozo. And that's the only reason why I went to Pozo for the last 15 years is to be able to go to Indo. <laughs> that's it. So... <laughs> that's amazing so, so i guess what... so i guess you would fully call yourself like a soul surfer or a free 
free surfer, probably one of the yeah, only ones in the sport, right? No, no, no. I think we are all, we are all because um, last night I checked the interview you did with Matteo, uh, Yakino. And uh, yeah, you guys talked a lot about the slalom, the preparation, I don't know, the competition, all this thing. But I, I, don't, I really don't know him good, you know, Matteo. I know him, I just say hi and we don't really cross on the contest. So I don't know him, but uh, the image I had before this interview is actually seeing, seeing him surfing in La Torche when we had the event, there was no win. And I was impressed because he's a really good surfer. And then I, I saw footage of him wave riding. And I'm thinking, you know, it's, it's like Antoine and all these guys, you know, they are fucking beasts in competition in Salo. But they're like true watermen and they love it, you know, they're like, so they are so surfers also, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah this is what this Jimmy is Diaz said in, in his interview that the one thing that everybody of those guys, Bjorn, Antoine, Matteo, I don't know, yourself, Philip, Brazinho, whatever, that all of them are super different. But the one common denominator is that everybody has, like, the number one thing driving you is the love for, for actually windsurfing, you know? So I think uh, yeah. then your goals might change, your, your way of, like you say, preparation might change. But, but without that love, I don't think any of us would be progressing anywhere you know and i think you see it and i think you see quite a few guys they lose that love they maybe do the tour for one two more years and then they're gone right yeah exactly it's, it's such a small spot and there is not really room for many people to live out of it and you cannot it's not like in tennis if you're like uh you know even if you don't really like it you can keep going because you're thinking fuck i'm making so much money or like I'm making good money and let's keep playing, you know, a bit. Uh, it's a job. In windsurfing, it's not really, a, it's not worth it if you don't have the, the passion for it, the love. So, yeah. And, and this being said, I think I'm, a, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm a soul surfer, whatever, but I think I'm a fucking like competitor. Like I'm super competitive. And uh, that's why I ended up having the results I have. Not because of my love, I, you know, I don't, I never consider myself like the best in the world ever. Um, but I'm, I think, I think I'm good, I'm good competitor, you know, I, I, I'm good at playing this game and I like it. Uh, yeah, that's what so. I was about to say, like, or ask the, the next question is that, yeah, maybe you say you go to pause only when you, that only because you want to go to Indo, but once you're actually in pause, you want to fucking win, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. No, no, no. I, it's not that I want to win. I don't want to lose, which is even stronger of a feeling, as you know, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the drive. Like, I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose. And uh, I had such a hard time at the beginning of my wave career because maybe people don't know now, but I was, I was uh, actually a freestyle competitor before. And uh, quite successful. Like I started when I was like 17, I think. And straight away I was like top, almost top 10, you know. And I've been like, I've been competing five or six years. And I was always like seven, eight, six in the world. And I did a fourth place a podium in freestyle. And But in the ways when I started to compete, I was like, you know, I was struggling. I was struggling. And I started late also, you know, I only started with, um, competing in the way when I was like, the first full year I was 22, my first full year on tour in the waves. But why do you think um, that is? Because I, I, I interviewed Brazinho also for the show and, and he, he also came through that same route because you don't start to windsurf because you want to freestyle. You start to windsurf because of the waves. Obviously, everybody does kind of. But then seems like all the young guys, uh, it's much easier for them to be successful in freestyle. What do you think that is? Um, I, I don't think it's true now, you know, but it was like uh, 10 to 15 years ago. It was not, now it's not the case. Now I think if you want to be good in the ways, then you can go to 
the Canaries and do the, all these junior events and you can enter the tour. And, but when the, I think all this generation, which is now kind of on top of the wave scene, like Prozinho, Ricardo, myself, Robbie Sweet, even Victor, we all competed in freestyle because it was new when we were like, I don't know, 18, 20. Brazilian was like 14, 13. I remember him like in 40, he was a, really a grub. And um, this it was like a fully new discipline, freestyle. And uh, it was such a chance for us. You know, like I say, I was, I think I was 16 my first event. I arrived, I was nobody. I had like, you know, I was nobody. And I was beating like Peter Volvata and I don't know, these guys like the legends of the sport. Mm -hmm. uh, John Sky, the guys you will see on the magazine, on the cover of the magazine, you know. And the only reason was that it was something new. So they didn't have an advantage of us. They didn't have experience because we all started from the same point, you know. Yeah, and then so you're younger was, uh, and you're and you're actually learning faster, right? Exactly, exactly. And you don't care so much, you know. And you don't have you don't have a family, and you don't have a, a career, and you don't have uh, you're just you can go and do the, try to make a flat car for two months every day nonstop and keep going, you know. That maybe an older guy wouldn't go through this. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So, yeah, so how, how, is it, how how is it like when you're let's say 17, 18? Your sponsors throw you a bunch of cash, a uh, little bit, but for an 18 year old, like anything is a lot. I remember it for myself that, you know, like I fought when I came on tour, I thought the guys were making millions, you know, the perspective obviously changes, but, yeah. um, but how is it like, there is a bunch of 18 year olds, like probably half the tour is under 20 of the freestyle tour and you're just traveling the world and having a good time and it must have been a crazy time i, I don't think we've seen this uh, ever since that early freestyle era so so tell us a little bit tell us maybe a few stories from that time yeah it's it's exactly what you say you know like for me and this is how i got into windsurfing i even quit my studies because of this because uh i never planned to become a pro but um uh, it's, it's not so long ago, but yeah, 2002, I started to, to compete and I quit my study 2005. Uh, I was making quite good money in the end, you know, if I think about it now. Fuck, you know, like for a teenager not paying for nothing, I was, there was more money and prize money was double. My first event, I got, first event ever, I finished 12, I got 2,000 euro prize money. And this is in 2002, so, you know, life was cheaper. And uh, this was a lot of money, so I could go out every night and and like a king, you know, like a fucking king. And uh, and also, yeah, like me, for like at this time, the old guys were Kaoli, Tonki, Tati, and they were nineteen, and they were the old guys. And uh, and the young guys were Brozinho, Anthony, they were thirteen, you know. And this was like uh, basically like a school trip, you know, when you go with your school to another country for a week and you do fucking bullshit but it was like this but we were even paid to do this you know making yeah. money and uh getting trophies not trophies but yeah it was it was it was amazing actually it was amazing like uh yeah. so on every school trip there is these guys sitting at the back of the bus that are the bad boys and there is yeah. the the guy sitting right to right next to the teacher in the front so tell us who was who at that time um i would say yeah i mean i don't wanna you know i don't wanna be harsh or talk shit about people but um or already yeah you could see brosinho he was he was already one of the most serious of us uh even though he was young you know he didn't really get influenced by the bad guys you know um Kaoli, even Ricardo. Ricardo was like, he looked, he always had this, he, he still has this little bit of a bad boy, you know, like a uh, little kid bad boy, but he never already went like out of control. So, they, and they were the guys like Kaoli, yeah, Kaoli, uh, Ricardo, they were winning and they were a bit more serious. And then there was the really bad boys, 
uh, I will include myself in, in them. Anthony, Kevin, Mevisen, I think we were uh, like the three of us, we were the good team, good team. Like, I, I'm, I'm not proud of it, but like, oh, I, I always tell the story to my friends. Like, I, for at least three, four years, I think that all, all my freestyle career, I, I almost, I've been competing. Like, we were all going out every night, like, two, two three, getting super drunk, pu almost puking, like, super, like, tra trashing ourselves and competing the next day. And, and this over and over and over, which is nothing to be proud of. But, uh, but it is pretty impressive. Imagine, imagine trying to do that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's why I always wonder. I'm like, actually, but I'm not even sure we would have done better, you know, being serious. Because when you're young, you recover so well. You're like, in the end of your life, you wake up in the morning, you think you're going to die. And then you just go and say like 10 minutes before you hit and then you're fine. Because you're, you're young, you know, you recover. The body is not the same. And, uh, and also, also, this is something I, I remember is like if the older guys, they were also partying. Like, uh, I remember, you know, I was a kid, but I was partying with Peter, Scotty, John Scott, everybody, everybody was going out, you know, not every night, but it was totally different. It was like really a different time. Like everybody was, there was more money. There was more, yeah, everything was easier. So yeah, it was different. It was a bit more like you didn't, if you would do this now, everybody would look at you like you're, you're an asshole, you're wasting your luck and you're being stupid. And, but before it was way more common, I would say, you know, to, to do all this bullshit. Yeah, definitely got a lot and, more serious with everything, with training, with this, with that. I mean, who would think like when you were starting, who would think a wave sailor would go to the gym? I mean, it's, it almost sounds stupid, right? But now it's normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So. Exactly. So yeah, different time. And uh, so yeah, all this to say that the freestyle was amazing because it got all of us to, it brought us like success. Good prize money and freestyle was more popular. You know, you will get pictures in the magazine for doing freestyle. Now, unless you're Goito or Amado, pff, you get nothing which yeah. is super sad for me it's a shame eh? but uh but you know they always say yeah but the market is small we don't sell equipment freestyle blah 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 so yeah there's different times but uh freestyle really was a big uh you know you, just to build like like in, you said in your interview with matteo that i listened to uh it's about getting this confidence you know this winning feeling and like start to feel like you belong there you know because at the beginning you you think you're not you're nobody and uh, mm -hmm. you look at the people like oh you know and then but then when you start to beat them on a regular basis then you think fuck actually maybe I maybe I belong there and then then it's easier to make the transition to waves because you can when you start competing in the waves you already have this taste of success you know from the first time and uh, you already learned how to compete. And now, nowadays it's different because we have this junior circuit, which is amazing for the kids. And uh, because, yeah, you, you can see they arrive, uh, they're 18, they already competed for five years. Like they have so much experience, you know? And this was not existing before. So we, the, the freestyle did this for us, but now they have those junior events to give them a chance. And it's sick. You, you see all these Canadian kids, this, Japanese kids, uh, kids from all over, French kids, everywhere, you know, there's the level of the kids is wow, so high in the waves, thanks to this, because it really pushes them and gives them a chance to, to, yeah. to compete, to compete, because you, if you want to be good at competing, you have to compete, you know, yeah. unless, yeah. You're, unless you're so, so much better than everyone else, like uh, Philip, for example, you arrive at 14, 15, and he was so much better that he didn't even need to have experience or Amado or you know this kind of people who are like so much better that yeah yeah you, you still really need to learn you still need to learn but, but, but yeah you still need to learn but you you don't need it so much it goes a bit quicker but uh, yeah it's always good to have the chance to yeah to learn how to how to play the game because competing is not about and this for me in the ways it took me many years to understand it's not about 
uh, making a show. It's not about looking good. It's about winning a hit, you know? And uh, Josh also said it uh, in his interview with you. And uh, I, for me, it was like a life-changing moment. It was in Cape Verde, I remember, 2008. Uh, I watched Nick Baker going to the final. Uh, and uh, yeah, I lost early in the single. I watched him and I, and I remember I was talking with one of my friends and I say, fuck, but actually, the, he's, he's the guy, you know, he's like, he's so good at what he's doing. He goes and he does exactly what he has to do to win the heat. And, and then he's in the final. And he was in the final in Pozo everywhere. This guy was in the final. You will not see him in the training, no? He was not the most flashy guy. Uh, but he just knew what he had to do to win. And, and the day I understood this, I was like, like yeah, okay, I'm just going to go make a pussy IIR, whatever. You know, I'm not going to go critical, but I'm just going to go just to make sure I land this IIR and then I can make a couple more turns. And, 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 and then the, the next day I finished, I was like going through the double elimination until they stopped the event. I didn't lose. I finished fifth because they were running out of condition. But this was like the boom, change in my life, like in my wave career. Just to understand it's not about making a show. Uh, it's about just winning the hit. Yeah. That's that's insane. That's insane you say that. And probably Nick Baker could be maybe the, the best guy to never win a world title. You you think? Like so clinical and so like you say, ticking yeah. all the boxes. What, yeah, yeah. Do you think you need that Every that last flash, that last little bit of like what you say, this flair to to actually get through that or was it just bad timing for him or what i mean no i i think he would have totally deserved the world title but uh he could have he, he could have got one easy you know like people with with like less abilities than him got got one uh maybe myself for example and other people but uh yeah i think there's a lot of luck you know i don't know luck karma i don't know how you want to call it like the moment, you know, the circumstances and all these things. Um, it's like in tennis. I really like tennis, watching tennis. And if you think about it, in the last, I don't know, 15 something years, it's only three guys who won everything almost, you know? It's not because all the other guys suck. It's just that there's these three guys who are just better. Yeah. And maybe Nick Baker was in an era that there was like uh, these really strong people around him again fighting against him for the and he, he won he won the Aloha Classic, Nick Baker. He's been doing finals everywhere. I remember watching him in Brazil, I think he got second place in Brazil. Everywhere. He was this guy was always in the final. So he could have easily got the title. Yeah. But he just missed yeah, probably some luck, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so you touched on your world title. I mean for a guy that like you say only goes to Pozo to go to Indo. You have some pretty fucking good results, man. I mean, you've won Denmark twice, Silt twice or three times. Uh, yeah, twice. Yeah. Twice, yeah. Won the Storm Chase, won the indoor in Poland, in Warsaw, uh, and obviously got a, got a world title in, in uh, 2014. Um, that and, 2014... And I, I even got a... I even got a podium in Pozo, if you think about it. Nobody yeah, knows about a, this, but... You got a podium in Pozo, you got second in the Aloha Classic. I mean, actually, most of these results I mentioned, they actually happened in 2014. So maybe tell us what... Yeah, well... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like Pozo, I, I made the podium in 2017. Um, but, uh, yeah, in 2014, I was, uh, it was my year, for sure. For sure. But I wanted I, to I ask think, you yeah. what was different. Was something different or was it just you get on a roll and you just, yeah, you just start rolling? What was, what was the, you know, the mindset kind of like? I, I think it's a combination of many things. Like already I had won uh, my first event in 2012. So I, I knew, you know, I knew uh, it's possible. 
because before this, I never knew, thought I was going to win ever an event, you know, in the way I even make a podium. But then all of a sudden, boom, I win an event in 2012 in Denmark. So then you think, actually, once you get to the quarter final, you're not happy. You think maybe I'm going to try to get to the summits. And then when you get to the summits, you're like, I have a chance to go to the final, you know, you start. It's, it's not that you think you're better, but you, 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 you actually look always what's next, you know? So there's this, then I was getting more experience, I guess. Um, and then we made this, we, we changed the boards. We made a big change in between 2013 and 2014 with Fabian, uh, with the boards and the, the new boards I had at the beginning of the year 2014. They were so good. You know, when you get this board that you feel like you're, you cannot fall. Whatever you do, you're not going to fall and you can do whatever you want. Sometimes you get this, you know, it's like my Camille, he called this the, the magic board, you know. We all have this magic board, like um, you guys in the slime, you have this mast or fin, I don't know, this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so this gives you a lot of confidence. And so it was like, yeah, the experience, the equipment. And, um, and, then, and then it all clicked when I got the, um, actually that year I started in Pozo with a, with a shitty year. We run just a single in the last day of the event in maybe 20 centimeter wave. It was only yeah, one was wave flat. to jump counting. It was flat, it was Fun flat. It was one, the only time in history that they only counted one wave because it was completely flat. So I passed one hit and then I lost. So I had a shitty result. Uh, but I mean, for me in Pozo, I was not really expecting anything anyway. And then I went to Tenerife and somehow I got second. And this was like also like a big uh, moment for me because I, after this, I thought, fuck, uh, if I can do second place in Canaries, well, for me, I'm a bad sailor, you know, I'm really a bad, I'm, I don't consider myself a good sailor there. Then I can make a podium anywhere, you know. Not that I'm going to make a podium anywhere, but I can. I can. If it's possible, then, you know. And with this, like you say, I went to... Uh, uh, yeah, and I won the Storm Chase in the beginning of the Before, year. Before, yeah. So, so probably this was... Yeah, I think when this happened, already I was with myself. I was like, okay, you know what? Now, even if I do last all the PWA event of the rest of the year, I don't care. I did my job. The sponsors are happy. I'm going to get a contract next year, you know. And I'm going to be able to keep on windsurfing. So I don't care anymore. And when you have this pressure off your shoulders, it's way easier to perform, you know? Um, so, yeah. And then, yeah, then Denmark, it was like this onshore condition, which are my best conditions. That's why I'm the, be the best, you know, compared to the rest of the guys. Um, that's the only conditions where actually I think, I really think like, fuck, I can't, if, if nothing happens bad, I really have a chance to win, you know, when it's like this really bad on shore, especially if it's a little bit from the right, but even dead on shore, uh, I'm like, yeah, these are my conditions. So I was really confident and uh, then I won and then, yeah, second, first, and then in France, it was this, this cross on starboard attack, which is my conditions, where everybody else kind of sucks. And that's why I'm, I'm much better. You know? Normally I go to Canaries and I'm, I suck and everybody is so good. But then when the wind goes the other way, a little bit onshore, I'm like, it's, it's the opposite. I know I'm better, you know, than most of the guy. I'm not the best, but I'm better than most. Um, so I'm, I'm not really stressing. In Pozo, I'm like, you know, first hit against anyone. I'm like, I'm shaking. I'm like, this guy is better than me in reality. You know, he can do things that I cannot do. And all I can do, he can do. So it's going to be tricky. But then when it's these different conditions. Uh, so, yeah, I think that year was good because we had a lot of uh, different conditions. And, yeah, it was solid waves in Denmark. La Torche was also solid waves. Uh, and then I went to Maui and I was like, uh, you know what? Anyway, I have nothing to lose. And if I, if I made all this podium in all these conditions, why not? If I made a podium in, in what's the name, Tenerife, I can do a podium in Maui, you know? Because I'm, I'm not a good sailor in Tenerife. So if it's happening there, it can happen. 
And then I made a second place and I won the title. But, okay. and I was also gonna get the baby, which, which was my only goal I ever had in my life, you know, to have a family and have a kid. And uh, I was like over the moon already that my wife was, not, she was not my wife yet, but that my girlfriend was pregnant. So yeah, it was like, you know, when you're like in everything is like, ah, oh, so good, you know? You're not worrying about nothing. So yeah, special, yeah. And it was good, I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, I'm sure you did. I'm yeah. sure you did. Did that, did winning one, which, you know, probably at the beginning of the year, it's maybe like you don't think about it, but then I don't know. Once you win in Denmark, for sure, you start thinking about it, especially that you've seen Brazinho do it after winning Denmark the previous year. But um, do you like after you win one, do you feel maybe less pressure and more freedom to do what you actually always wanted to do and focus on more doing trips and try to find some? extra sponsors for for that, those missions which you did you know like you're a world champion now you have this you know how it is for people outside of the sport like once you're world champion you go three steps ahead even though inside nothing really changed and yeah. did that relieve the pressure for you from competing and maybe putting the focus a little bit towards no other I, things no it was the opposite it was the opposite like before before I, I always consider myself more like a free rider you know i thought yeah actually my not i thought like it was the reality my sponsors were paying me for the trips not for the not for not for being top 10 in PWA, you know they were more paying me for doing already i was already doing videos and uh, always a lot of articles in mag magazines were big still at this time and with all my travels, I was, that was my focus, you know? But then when I won the title, I remember the next year going to Bozo, first event. I was like, uh, you know, I had this Lycra with the number one on the back and I was like, oh my God, you know? I'm the, I'm, <laughs> I just hope I'm not gonna lose first round, you know? <laughs> you are the target. Yeah, yeah, I'm the target, and I know I I I know I was not the best guy, so uh, I actually I had more pressure. I was like, now I have to I have to kind of show everyone that it was not just luck, and I'm not so bad, you know. And uh, so it was a lot of pressure actually. I remember I had a, it was a tough year after, and um, yeah. Yeah, like, I don't think. And I, yeah, and I broke my. I don't think anybody thought it was luck after you came on the podium in like all the events except yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, you know, you know how sometimes you in your own head you see things different than people from outside, and um, so yeah, actually it made me more pressure. And because I got more pressure, then I was like, okay, you know what? If I get all this pressure on myself, I'm gonna do even more. If if it was not, it's not that I was doing more, but I was like, I'm doing, I'm gonna do it more seriously, all this trip and big wave thing, because I was always doing it. But for years, I've been doing it with nobody to film it, or you know, like uh, I was like, okay, I'm gonna make this more professionally. So in case I really fuck up on the tour, uh, I can surf on this world champion wave, like you said, you know, yeah. use these new statues that I have. And also, like a lot of people, I think didn't really know me so much until I was world champion, and uh, and then people who don't really care so much, then they heard more about me. So yeah, it opened me more opportunities. I think to like I got like more support for what I was doing already before, you know, like this big wave. Um, it gave me more like credibility. Uh, yeah, legit. I was, I was like more legit, you know, a little bit in the eye of people for doing it yeah i think no people but, but are, I, I don't think i don't think much maybe changed um how you how you carry yourself because <laughs> my friends they were in denmark and they're like ah we met Thomas. he came with this old van just uh rigged up he was super he we came to talk he was super nice like uh like uh, if we would be like they were like there was no world champion vibe 
let's say, you know, like if you think about walking out to Bjorn, for example, yeah. you know, that I'm still stressed until, uh, until today, even though I know him from uh, 15 years or 10 years or whatever, uh, <laughs> you know, to you, I think not much has changed yeah. now in your head. No, no, this for sure. For me, I'm the same guy. You know, it's, it's nothing. It doesn't change nothing. And it's not because uh, I'm world champion. I need to have a new van with my face on it, you know. I, I, I respect people who do this. They get support for this. I don't like it. I will never do it. And that's it, you know. So, uh, and I like my van, you know. I don't want to sell my van. And all these things, I, mean, I don't want to change nothing, like you say. But I think this, the, the, the big difference is like most of my life, windsurfing life career, I've been traveling to places where there are no windsurfers. So 90% of the places I go, people don't have a fucking idea who I am and what I'm doing, you know? So I'm just myself. And sometimes, yeah, it's like this. And this is what I really enjoy. You know, you go someplace and then the people, or, or they don't just don't care or, or they're like, Sometimes they come, when you come out of the water, they come to you and they talk to you and they're fucking happy to see you and doing what you do. But they have no idea if you're good or not. They just like it, you know? And, uh, and they, just, they just like what they see and, and they will have a conversation with you for what you are, not for what you're supposed to be. Or, you know what you mean? Well, yeah, what you I mean? can see it straight away. You know, I don't get that in, in the same amount, of course, as you, but I mean especially like back home yeah i can after two words you know if the guy knows who you are or not right like yeah if, yeah, yeah yeah exactly exactly and yeah and, and most of my trips people uh, they don't know they don't know so i'm i'm really i think this is this is this is what i like also to to keep everything fresh always and and, uh, yeah, imagine and, and the being, same, you know? being, uh, imagine being Kelly Slater, you know, you can't really do a trip without, you know, there will be guys no. around, you know? No, that's a good thing about windsurfing. It's such a small spot. Nobody knows us. And, uh, there's no, there's no popularity or anything. We are nobody, you know, like, uh, any girl with a nice ass on Instagram, she's more popular than me. So, uh, yeah, whatever, you know, and, and uh, yeah, that's just, just Which is not say. really, also not really fair and not really what it's supposed to be, but it's the way it is, right? I mean, uh, whatever. Yeah, but it's nice. It's nice. And, and, and the same way, you know, if I'm on a shitty day, sometimes I'm in a shitty mood, you know, I'm, I'm like anybody. And uh, if I don't want to talk to someone and someone comes, like I'm, on some windsurfing spot and someone comes to talk to me and I'm in shitty mood, I will not try to pretend I'm uh, this cool guy if I'm not in a good mood on the day because I don't care. Because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get one million comments on Facebook, people telling that I'm a dick or this because I did this because nobody cares about me and about windsurfing mm -hmm. in reality. That's what I like about windsurfing. We can, I feel like we have this freedom to be ourselves, you know? Yeah, for compared sure. to other sports, we don't have this pressure of media. Even though sometimes, yeah, like you, you talked about this, uh, this little uh, tss, that Bernd created on the net, and sometimes once in a while you see. I I also did some things like this sometimes, picking out and making some people a bit crazy at me, but it's really it's nothing, you know. It's like in the end, it's pff. we have this freedom, you know, to to yeah, to say I, what we think. And to be what we are and i think we'll get to it but i think not many people actually do it people still think they're gonna get scrutinized and their brand manager goes on their instagram and judges them and things like this i think people care way too much like you say for what we are imagine if you are cristiano ronaldo or someone you know like yeah then then it makes a difference you know but, but now like us. Me especially, you know, sometimes I put some stuff that is uh, maybe funny to me or whatever, and it's not really, nobody understands. And then, you know, I get some shit from some places and uh, like, come on, like, who cares? It's just me, you know? I'm not going to create yeah. an image that is artificial or, or whatever, you know? Yeah. 
and some and some people will care and because they are super passionate and then it's a good thing in a way you know if they care because they because they care and that means there's some people who are really windsurfing fans and it's nice to see good you know even if they get pissed at you or at me sometimes or at beyond for what he says that means yeah okay there is some people who, and that's great you know that's why we're still here calling ourselves professionals uh but uh but yeah it's, it's like it's okay in the end in the end what's important is what you do in the water you know i think yeah you mentioned trips you mentioned traveling you mentioned doing it a little bit more seriously these days how do you even start how do you even plan a trip and how do you even decide where to go hmm. um so all the time that people spend training their body, I spend on the internet <laughs> checking whatever, you know, like really whatever. Like mostly, usually it starts from a picture I see from someone surfing. It comes mostly from surfing, you know, because the surfers have been exploring the planet since 50 years, I would say. Like they're really pioneers you know they've been everywhere everywhere and uh, so this and then google map is like uh, google earth google earth is like such an amazing tool and you know sometimes you just go and start to go one place and spend two three hours on google earth like just riding over the planet and then you find these things and these places and then you start to google the name of the place to see if you find pictures and you type like the name of the place with the word wave start to look for pictures beam, beam, beam. then go on wingoro check the archives to see if you have archives to see what's the statistic you know what win you get how often uh you know this thing like it's just like a little bit of uh yeah, like journalism, you know, you look, you look, you scratch, you look, you look, you look, and then you get all these informations, and then you have all these spots, you know, slowly you build, on, you build your own map, you know, like, when I go to a spot, usually it's not like uh, someone, it's never happened that someone told me, oh, uh, there's this spot, come, and I go, yeah, okay, when I was 16, it happened. When I went to Indo, we, uh, all my first trip that I did with my really good friend, photographer, Gilles Calvé, he brought me to Indo, to Cocos Island, to Madagascar, to all these places where I would, I would have never been on my own. But after, from there, I got the, this taste and then, and then I have all these places and I knew, I know they are there. I know, I know what they need to work. Uh, and then, then you just have to wait for the moment. So just keep looking at the forecast. Just look at the maps. And when you see there's something, you know, you see, I'm, I'm doing mostly in the Atlantic, you know. So I, I check this Atlantic map and when there's this big system, I'm like, I see where it's going to hit, you know, like where there's going to be the most swell and the wind. And, and then, and then I go closer. I'm like, okay, this could be a storm for this area. Then I go closer and then I'm like, okay, yeah, there was this spot that I remember that could be being bam, boom. It's like a little, it's like a game. It's really, it's, I love, it's for me, it's a passion, you know, I, I love it. I love it. And then, uh, and then you go and I mean, you have to, it's, you always have to take the risk because you never really know when it's somewhere that nobody ever windsurfed, you would never find someone to tell you how it is to windsurf. So you have to go. And but, you told uh, me one interesting thing when I asked you, because I was looking at Iceland for, I don't know, two years before you went and I got to some locals and stuff and they told me about this side onshore sandy beach and then we we spoke about it and you were like man never listen to locals <laughs> you told me exactly this. <laughs> exactly yeah that's my number one rule never listen to locals like yeah w once once you go to the spot and if there are locals on that spot yes you have to listen to them but uh but normally if you go to a spot when you know if you want to do something new the people never went there so the the, the locals People, they are not going to tell you to go there because they don't know about this place, you know? Yeah. And that's the, and, and most people, they, they don't look for the same thing than me. Yeah. So, you know, they look for, like you say, a sandy beach, easy, not too big waves. And I'm looking for a reef, 
uh, with as much wave as possible, the most powerful I can find. And I don't know, like I'm looking for something different. So yeah, almost everywhere, if you listen to the locals, they are going to bring you to a spot which is good for them, which it's not what you're looking, what I'm looking for. So I never, I never ask any locals in front, never, never. But like, for example, this year I went to Galicia twice in the, in the winter. And there I met these local guys and they're fucking amazing people, you know, like they're surfers. One of them, he, he's a bit of a kiter, but they're, they're like surfers. And they like, these, these are the kind of locals that you want to listen to because they're like, they know everything, you know, but they're not windsurfers and uh, they're locals. You know, it's not about the local windsurfer. You have to listen to the locals, but not the local windsurfers, basically. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a nuance, nuance, like a difference. So out of out of ten times that you go to a new place, how many times do you score, and how many times you just eat the for me, the bills? For me, I always score. For me, it's always a success. I never had a not success. I don't know because I have no expectations. You know, I go to this new place, so it's always going to be a success. It, it's just also a preparation thing that you've actually done. A lot of the homework already, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and and I always, I'll, usually when I go, it's always good. I mean, yeah, I've been to trips where the conditions have been like uh, not super amazing. Like I would say, for example, Mozambique. We went there in two thousand, I don't know, fifteen, something like this. We sailed, I think, six or seven days. In twelve days, we were there. Okay, we are like head eye. Not was not amazing side show. I was not like this Cabo Verde style, but still, you know, in the end we scored and we surfed like every day. And it was nice. So, and we knew we knew it was not uh, gonna get. We were not gonna get the Punta Preta. It was yeah. more like maybe if we're lucky, we get this special swell and this sand bank is gonna work and we can get something like Jordi Smith had in his video. But we knew the chance was like really tiny. But the backup we knew was gonna be good. But the rest, honestly, I don't want to be pretentious. Eh? But uh, usually, when I go, I score because I'm I'm really spending a lot of time. Like before I go, I look, I look, I look, I look, and even like uh, you know, like on yeah, on Magic Seaweed, you have people like posting pictures. They have the date. Yeah, there's the date on it. Or a lot of videos and surfing. This this like amateur, they put this video on YouTube with like 50 views. The quality is shit, everything is shit, but there's the date. And then you can look at the archives on Wingoro and you know, you know, okay, with that forecast, they got this. So now if I have a forecast with like the double of waves in the same wind, it's gonna be, you know, twice bigger. And that's how it works. It's, it's simple in a way. Um, yeah, but to but, for uh, you to have that da database in your head, I think is amazing. I think this is what what separates you from maybe all the other guys that you have this. Okay, you see this blob moving one way or the other, and you're like, okay, probably we should look at these few spots or whatever. So I think this is this is the difference, and also being ready, always being ready, right? Yeah, yeah, I was gonna, uh, I was gonna say that because that's the difference. I'm, I'm not going to, to, to Chile for one month or to South Africa for two months or to Maui for three months or I don't know. I'm not doing this. I'm staying here at home. So that's the only way to be ready. And because of this, I'm not training like the other guys. I missed a lot of training that these guys do. You know, like this daily training. Like I'm gonna walk on my daval day after day after day. I'm not doing this. So I sacrificed something, you know, yeah. for for being ready for the right day, and also also the difference. And this is, I think, something that's that's probably the biggest difference most people don't realize is that time is flying. You know, when it's on, you have to go. You cannot think, uh, um, yes, no, yes, no, maybe next time. No, you have to go. If the forecast is good, you go. You know, you cannot wait for the next one. And this is something like, that's why mostly, most of the time I go alone on my trip. Sometimes I have a friend or two, but it's rare. 
because most of the people they're like, ah, oh, yeah, I wish I could, but now I'm busy and then the next one I come. No, if you want to go, it's you know when it's on. You cannot. And and for and this I also get inspired by the surfers because the surfers they are like they fucking go, you know. The the guys they travel the they they don't care. They 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 drop everything and they go. You know they have this culture of like uh, committing super hard. Yeah, chasing. Even stuff. if they're gonna catch maybe, yeah, maybe they catch only one wave or two, you know. And they go, they make all this effort. They go for one week away. They leave the family at home and they spend all this money for this one wave. But the only way you're gonna get this wave is if you go. Uh, you cannot only go if you're if you're like okay, yeah, now I can really go because I have nothing to do and I know it's gonna be all perfect. No, 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 no. I, I think it's always risk. it's always like if you go and you don't score, I'd rather go and not score than not go. Like. It's the same, like you see a hot chick at the bar. Okay, now you don't because you're married, but you see the hot yeah, chick. Yeah, exactly. You'd rather, exactly. You'd rather come and get slapped than yes. go, right? And not not try. Yeah. Yeah, and the same, like you if I follow your your example, uh, you see the guys, the guys who go usually the score with the chicks. Even if they're not the most beautiful looking man or the most smart guy of the group, is the one who goes who score. So who goes the on chick, tour? You know? Come on, spill the beans a little bit. I have no fucking idea. I'm not going out anymore. Like really, I have zero. I I, I will say, but I, I don't know. I just don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay, back to serious business. Your top five destinations you managed to to travel to so far. Uh, just pure windsurfing, pure conditions, windsurfing. Just sailing. Pure sailing, windsurfing. Uh, Chile was really good. Um, Cape Verde for sure. Portugal has to be there. Ireland. So that's. Two. Okay, Just whatever. Say. Just keep Chile. going. Keep going. Yeah, Chile, Cape Verde, Portugal, Ireland, Maui. Come on, Maui. Maui is on the list, top five. And, like these are um, quite these are quite popular destinations in the end. Like anything super under the radar that that people don't realize maybe how good it is and and you no. But what, when when I say for. Cape Verde, when I say Cape Verde, Portugal, Ireland, yeah, it's it's, it's popular. But yeah, people go to Ponta Preta in Ireland. They go to Marroti uh, in Cape Verde. They go to Ponta Preta. There's so many other spots. You know, I'm not talking about this one spot. I'm talking about the whole picture. So in Indo is amazing, but what I don't like about Indo is a bit too radical, and you you really you really cannot make mistake. You break pff, way too much gear. It's like this I don't like. This is amazing. Like Chile. Somehow you you just okay. Even if you break, but nothing happens. It's kind of yeah, yeah. yeah. And Cape Verde is good for this because it's a perfect ways. Yeah, you break gear, but it's it's kind of easy, you know. Like uh, there are places you can really get in trouble. Like in in Indo, fuck if something happens to you, uh, you're far you're far from everything, you know. I remember I had one day there. I was big. I was along with uh, my friend Brendan. Who was filming. Uh, it was super big. It was so scary. Like. Like my friend was on the beach basically, and I know he's a, he's a shy guy. Uh, I know he wouldn't talk to anyone, and he had no fucking idea about the world in Indonesia. And I was alone on my own in the middle of nowhere. If something happens, I'm fucked, you know. And this this is like uh, this. That's why some places are more friend like uh, yeah. Friend user friendly. I, 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 user friendly. Yeah, that's the word. That's the world. But I think I think there's potential for for new places to be found. But Canar Canar is also amazing, you know. This I I'm 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 a guy honestly. Always people ask me, so oh, oh, what, what's your best place? I, I don't really have a best place. I like everywhere. I think you can find you know friends. Friends I've been I I've been scoring fucking epic conditions in France also. This is yeah, my home country. The Isle de something, the Isle of Cows. Isle of, yeah, 
Yeah, but this is the easy one. But like uh, even in the Basque country, I got uh, I had a couple of sessions in probably uh, almost the biggest wave, biggest wave of my life there. And uh, it was not really well documented because I didn't have like a film or something. But yeah, uh, you you everywhere, man. You can really if you look for it, and if you go on the right time, right place, everything you can. Yeah, that's, Cocos that's Islands. Of, uh, I think this is this hmm? is one of the first one. Cocos Islands. This is the first time Cocos. I think I saw you in a in a in a movie. Freaking light wind, but <laughs> the waves they looked yeah. insane. Wow! Yeah. Yeah, that was insane. But you know what? I, I'm not gonna say this one in the top five because the uh, the conditions we had. I think it was like something that happens once every ten years. Yeah. So yeah, it was, and 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 it's like the wave is too fast. There's no channel. You know, it's like there's no end to the wave. You know, yeah. you cannot kick out. It's not like you end up in a channel and the wave is finished. Uh, and there's no beach and it's like a reef like super shallow like maybe this shallow with like this live coral fucking sketchy maybe now I will enjoy it more I have a better level I remember I was really scary to sail there huh? heavy and sketchy and and big well, yeah, well, big and big yeah Sc Scotty was absolutely ripping uh, I remember I, have, I still have this vision you know like this vision of him doing this amazing turn in front like me going up like you know like along the whale and him like on the mass and a half barrel like going like <sighs> yeah like wow memories yeah this kind of memories and this is why i keep traveling and looking for new places yeah this kind of uh inspiration from scott and this kind of guy and you know scott is also one of these guys like you will never think the guy is a world champion or anything the guy is just uh, the legend, like, but he's like, uh, he's just who he is, and uh, he doesn't, yeah, like, big inspiration for me. I like this kind of people, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so big waves. Um, you mentioned because basically, when you travel, you want to travel for either heavy or must high plus or whatever, right? You, you want to travel for something, or at least lately, you have been traveling for big stuff i mean the stuff you've written north shore fuerte or portugal or or even Brittany. i mean big big stuff yeah. how much more comfortable do you feel in big waves these days than than you felt maybe 10 years ago or 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 15 years ago and and why why this is what's interesting for me honestly i don't feel more comfortable at all uh I, I think it's it's almost the opposite because now I have more pressure because when I go to a place like this, I have uh, one guy taking picture, one guy taking video, I'm paying for these people, you know. So I'm like investing money in this and I know I have to I have to write well and uh, I have pressure on myself, you know. Yeah, more. but if I look at you uh, on the Cocos Islands uh, trip, for example, I mean, these days you would freaking hit that thing so hard that you know, yeah, like, yeah, for sure. No, but this this is a this is a matter of a level. I was I was just not a good sailor, not as good as I am now. This time, you know, I grew I grew up in Marseille, riding small waves, uh, starboard tack, cross on, strong wind. So if you put me you put me in a mast and a half barreling, port tack, cross off, I had no experience. No, but but this I think the level I got it. You know, it comes, or you get it in a couple of years, or you never get it. But I don't think I'm, I, I improved so much uh, over the last 10 years. I, I don't really think I improved much, which is, which sucks. I wish I improved I think more. you did, but <laughs> I think, <laughs> no, I but... mean, when I look at these videos now, man, it's like double mast in Fuerte, mast and a half. And the first, first shot of the video, you just fucking bottom turn, go straight under it and hit it do a massive air and like yeah. either and, and you're not the kind of guy that wouldn't put crashes in the video for sure you put crashes but there's just not many yeah. of them. no 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 that that's the, the okay that that's true the, that's 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 the only thing i improved i think is that i'm not crashing so much like before before i will do the same but i will go too crazy on the wrong section 
and just uh, destroy everything. And then I cannot sail anymore because I have no more gear. You know, and this with the years, I really learned it's not about uh, going out first wave and going like a madman. You know, that's not how you do it. You have yeah. to, you only go. That's my, my whole philosophy about big wave riding is like, you, when, when the section is there and you're in the right place, uh, you go, you know, it's not even a question of what, like, whatever, I go, I don't care. But if it's not happening, I'm not going, you know? And uh, like, like this session I'm talking to you, I, was, I just talked about in, in Indonesia. It was in, a, I don't know if you saw this teaser of this movie we did just like that. I do yeah, this, sure. two massive airs. I think it was probably my, yeah, two of my biggest, craziest airs. That day I was sailing almost three hours. I only did these two airs. And the rest I did just straight and out because I, there was no, you know, I didn't want to kill myself. So I was just waiting for the right moment. But this is and again, this you the, can do when you're the, alone. The girl at the bar, because like I still remember a section like I had in Chile for one month, I had one big day, like a month and a half, let's say. And there was one section kind of soft, you know, like easy. But there was only one section I could hit on the first wave. I pussed it out and I remember until now, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes it's on the first wave. It can happen. It's on the first wave. And you day. have to go. And, and I and didn't go. And I Yeah, exactly. Like, and then you go. You have to go. Yeah, that, that's the whole thing, you know? You have to, when it's there, you have to go because especially with the wind, the waves, they, they get really affected by the wind, you know? It's not like this perfect glassy surf that every wave is the same. You know, that's, we, why we I'm asking, that's why I'm asking, how do you feel more comfortable? Because it seems like they drop you from a helicopter somewhere in some place and on the first wave you can go, you know? Yeah, so that's, yeah, but yeah, yeah. That okay. has to be a certain mindset, you know? Yeah, mindset, like, yeah, this is just what I say. It's like when it's there, I go. I have no, no doubt on my ability to do it. If it's, if, if it's clear, you know, it's, it's really simple in a way. Big wave riding is such a simple, there's no, almost no technique. It's not like, like doing a perfect double on a chop. It's, you need to have the perfect technique. But to go hit a leap, you don't really need any technique, you know? It's only commitment. I so no no i mean there's a bit of technique but not so much not so much because every wave is different mm. so you cannot repeat the same the same the same you know you cannot think you cannot think oh, i'm only gonna throw it if i know i'm gonna land it you know when i go when i say you know what, that, that's the thing okay let's say i go to this big big wave place i see this big section I'm going not because I think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm nailing this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it 100%. No, I'm thinking if I think I have at least 30% chance, I go, you know. I never think I have 100%. But most of the time, you, you actually you have less than 10% chance of making it. And this is when you should yeah. not go. But you, cannot, you can never wait for the 100% chance of making it in big ways because yeah, it's and not, I and, and I think also you cannot get affected by what because some of these ways are legendary you know and and I think like I don't know you go to Jaws and just because it's Jaws uh, maybe you you just have way more respect you know and then you would ride the same wave like that in North Shore Fuerteventura and maybe you know, you would act differently just because it's not so famous or whatever. People, I mean, you no. wouldn't. That's the thing. That's, uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't see you doing that, you know, but. Uh, no, because when I went to Jaws, that's exactly what you say. For me, it was just another. Actually, I was like, fuck, this wave is just too perfect. It's just almost too easy, you know? Like, it's for sure it's the most perfect big wave I ever sailed. Like, the easiest, the most perfect. It's so clear, you know? Everything is so clear so much space everything is so uh, everything is quite so when I went, over there isn't it the cliff is big the the chop is big the the wave is big like everything you feel <laughs> I, yeah I, uh. <laughs> yeah 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 you, yeah you feel small but at the same time you trust the wave because you, you and because it's chose you i think that's how i had that's the feeling i had i was even trusting more what i was doing because I was like, okay, this wave, they've been riding for 20, I don't know, 30 years. 
it's it's perfect. If I if I go down and I see this section, and it looks like it's gonna do this, it's gonna do this. It's not this weird wave that kind of mutes out of nowhere and create a weird section, you know? Yeah. So that's why you see these people in surfing getting these incredible barrels because you know when once they make the drop and they see the they see the they see the potential for the bar, they know actually it's makeable and the wave is, is going to make the bar. Most other places, like in Brittany or everywhere I go, like it's only one out of 10 who has, has a clean section. You know, the rest, they make something ugly and you're just going to break yourself and your gear if you go for it. There's no chance of success. So... So that's the that's the, the the difference. That's crazy. But I don't know much about Jaws. I only say two two times. The only two times I saw it breaking, I sailed, but that was that was it. Yeah. I never spent the winter in Maui, so I'm not. Uh, uh, and and also what you say, like this this thing of going to new place. Yeah, I went to Indo when I was 16, then to Cocos, and with my friend Gilles, he brought me everywhere, all over the world. And uh, and he, he, I remember my first trip to Indo. So I was 16 and uh, and I told him, I was like, yeah, but you know me, actually, I said more starboard tack. I'm not so good. And he was like, yeah, but why the fuck did you come here? You know, I'm here to make pictures. So if you're here, you have to go for it. And if not, uh, you know what, just fucking don't come next time, you know? Yeah. And I was, that was, that was tough, you know, to hear. But uh, then I was like, Okay, you know, and now I'm here. I'm with this professional photographer. They paid me this trip to come to Indo. I have to go for it, you know. And and from there, from there, this was my strategy. Like on my trips, then you build this relationship with your friend, the photographer. You know, he's there. You know, you're also doing it for him. Uh, you cannot let him down. And it's extra. Mo- yeah, uh, it's super motivating, isn't it? Because you are sure he's gonna get it. If you yeah. if you crash super hard, it's as good of a picture as anything that you don't crash. So you just yeah. go for it, and it's rewarding, you know. Maybe less. Yeah, for the I mean. Show, but... Yeah, no. For the for the picture, actually, it was it was hard on me also when I was crashing because it was also like, ah, you're a fucking idiot. Now you have no more gear, you know. Fucking douchebag. And the next time, take it easy, you know. Yeah. So it was a bit uh, saying one thing and the opposite. But uh, I like this kind of uh, attitude, you know? Straight. Like, yeah. yeah, and also there's no truth. You can say one thing and the opposite the next day, and that doesn't mean it's right or wrong. Or, yeah. You know, it's all about, uh, like, taking what you can from it. And, and yeah, like, uh, yeah, like all these trips I made with him and then with other people, you learn this, like, to perform, you know? You have this one day of condition, and that's it. Yeah. That, that's what happens in most trips, you know? Okay, you have more days, but usually you have one good day, if you have one good day. Yeah. And that good day, you have to go for it. You cannot cannot wait to get... You know, I had it so many times with people on trips, they're like, in the end of the day, they are like, ah, oh, yeah, but you know, I was getting used to the place. No, but you cannot get used to the place. By the time you get used, the session is over and the trip is over. You have to, you know? Yeah. So who and, 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 and this... And this is the thing also, the, the bigger the waves, the more it's like about uh, this instinct, like this survival, this like, uh, you just, you really commit, like you give everything you have, you know? On a small shitty day to make a little taka for the video or no, you can try 20, crash, it's different. But when it's big wave and you know you can hurt yourself and you're scared and you can break your gear and you don't know if you break or you're gonna, Maybe you swim with the current. You don't really know, you know. You never. Yeah, really in know. a bad situation, you can even die. I mean, it's it happened before. So. Exactly, exactly. So, so you really, if you if you go, you have to commit. And this is for me. This is the the essence of what I'm doing. You know, I go somewhere and I'm really, I'm giving everything I have. Like I don't care. Like, yeah. Like, so who's who? Who would be your who would be on your perfect trip, perfect team for for a trip? My perfect team. Well, I, I don't want to make uh, enemies. But this question. No, perfect trip, per, perfect team are like my best friends. 
basically. Like people, I would say people I had trips, I can, I can only talk with people I had trips because some people, maybe they would be the perfect guy, but I don't know. So the people I really had, uh, yes, I, I talked about Scott McCarcher, was amazing to travel with him. And um, Bujma, we did this uh, trip to Brittany. Bujma, I mean, I know him since we were kids and he's, I, I love him, you know, he's like such a good guy. And like super honest and also like living the moment, you know, on the beach and always, he's always like, he's always in the moment, you know. Uh, Wesh Taboule, Julian Taboule is also this kind of guy. Like he's sharing everything, you know, like full, full. Like he's not this guy who's gonna go and be on his phone until you tell him, okay, now it's time to go sail, you know. He's like believing the trip. And for me, this is the, this is what I like uh, with people, with people to travel to, you know, it's not, yeah. yeah. And, and they commit, you know, Bujma is a fucking charger, Wesh the same. They're not scared of anything. I know them, I know I can trust them. And I know if something goes wrong, they're gonna help me. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Alex, my friend Alex is the one I shall, is my best friend on tour. Uh, and one of my maybe he's my best friend actually I don't know it's something it's hard to say he's your best friend I okay. shot so much but uh, unluckily he, uh, you know life life made that he had this kid really early and he could not travel so much so we kind of stopped traveling together but it was we also with him we traveled so much like uh, it was amazing like really amazing you know you go you have the best time and you go in the water and the guy is on the same, yeah, like fully committing and just for fun. And, uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I would just go with my friends. I don't, I don't really care. What I don't like is like when people are like, you know, kind of scared or whatever and they're trying to, to block you, you know, they're like, they make you doubt, you know, this is what I hate. I don't want to go with anyone who is like, oh, but, oh, but maybe we should do it like this. Oh, but you don't think, oh, uh, uh. No, 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 I don't like this. <laughs> you know, I like just boom, boom, boom. Go. Just go and do it. Yeah. Okay, so, what, <laughs> so what's on top, of, on top of your list to, to, to sail still before you retire? <laughs> Um, I would like to sell Jaws again. That's one thing for sure. Because like I said, I only sailed twice and uh, it was like amazing. So I would like to do it again. Um, Maybe a place like you haven't been to? Place I haven't been to. Yeah, but if, if there's a place I haven't been to, it's because I don't know about it almost. So... <laughs> I don't know, like the, you know, some, uh, well, wait, let me Fiji, think. you've been to Fiji? No, but I don't want to go to Fiji. Why not? <laughs> because it's too, it's too expensive. It's too far in boats, jet skis. Uh, you're going to break everything. The way is fucking tricky. It's like, there's so many surfers, too many, too much people, too much, too much. I don't like this. The waves for sure is amazing, but it's just too much, you know. I I don't like I don't like people around. Like, uh, I wouldn't go. Yeah, if if it was if it was cloud break, uh, kind of uh, in Indo with nobody, I would go. But uh, I don't know. Or if you invite me, Machek, if you say, "Come on, Thomas, I have a ticket for you. You come, you pay nothing, you just uh, sit in this plane. I bring you there. I organize everything." Yeah, then I come to yeah, Fiji. At least for you, it's to make some, all the sort of, some sort of part of a job. For me, it's fully like a, fully like a hobby. It's like a, I could spend this money on fins or foils or whatever, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but for me, yeah, but for me, it's part of my job. And like you say, I could spend this money to go to Fiji. I can, I can spend three winters traveling in Europe. So yeah. I prefer yeah. to travel in Europe. I would get Ireland. Ireland... Uh, uh, Malagmo, I want to go. Yeah, that's a place. I, I almost went last year, but then I had a bad feeling, and the trip, everything went a bit wrong. And I had bad feeling. I, I felt like 
uh, scared, yeah. which never really happened before. So I thought, okay, I'm not going. Yeah. Biggest, so, but I want to go there. Biggest fuck up you had on a trip, like uh, traveling. We've all had some stuff, missed flights, whatever, but... <laughs> broken boats uh, i had things but i think I'm, I'm i think i was kind of lucky so yeah i had i had broken equipment and i had things no the worst if i think yes yeah, i went to basque country to a spot we wanted to sail uh with uh with wesh taboule it was 2000 yeah it was in 2009 when obama was the day when obama was elected 19th of january i think something like this 2009 and uh, we went there, drove like eight hours, the wind was blowing in the night, and then in the morning we go to the spot, it was like mast and half, double mast, this reef break that we wanted to sail, and the wind just died. So it was no wind, we went for nothing, and uh, we were like waiting, hoping it would come back, never came back anyway. So in the end of the day, drove back another eight hours back home, and then I arrived, I was kind of super pissed, you know, like, I'm not pissed, but like, yeah, a bit broken. And one of my friends in Marseille was, ah, we, we are having a party tonight, blah, blah, blah. And then I went party and then I went fucking crazy. And then uh, I left the party and uh, super drunk and I fell asleep on the highway and like crashed with my van, uh, almost died. And uh, so that was my worst trip. <laughs> Lost Hell the yeah. van. I yeah. was about to say after when you said that you drove eight hours back, that didn't sound too bad. But then I guess, yeah. No, no. Sorry. So that was the biggest fuck up. And yeah, like my gear flying on the highway, you know, like van, like running on the highway, everything flying off and me in the hospital. And mm. yeah, so that was the biggest bad trip fuck up. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I think we touched on this because I, I have some little questions I wrote down and I wanted to ask you if you feel pressure from your sponsors to perform on these trips, but I think you already, you already answered that. But why I'm, why I'm saying that is that we are professional windsurfers. We're supported by this industry and we're kind of in this little bubble that has certain rules, certain ways things are done and it is quite organized and quite schematic let's say you have a scheme and everybody sticks to it so my question is what pisses you off about the way this whole windsurfing world is run because i know there are things <laughs> that you would probably change if you could but um no. No, in the end of the day, I think everybody is trying to do his best. This is a bit, uh, you know, politically correct thing you could think, but it's really what I think. And uh, I don't know. I think, no, actually, I th actually, the only thing that pisses me off sometimes is when I see people like... Uh, doing things and uh, that I don't like and this is but this is only me being judgmental you know and this is stupid but we all have bad things in us so I think you know like yeah I would say yeah, maybe sometimes I think people take themselves too seriously you know this is something I never like like for what you know it's like a small sport and it's not really uh, we don't have to pretend we're something we're not you know but then, but then at the same time, uh, everybody is doing what they feel like doing to be happy. So I should not judge this. But this is one of the things that I think sometimes it's a shame because we could have more fun, you know, if people were just more, yeah, not taking it so seriously, not thinking they are what they're not. And yeah. do you find thing. it a little bit boring these days more than? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean when I say, yeah, it's a bit boring. I think it could be a bit more fun. But it's just, I, I think it's, it's not the, the fault of anyone. It's just the, how you say, the era, you know? We live in that's the society. That's what I mean. There is a in. certain scheme 
and I don't know, you get your contract, it says like, okay, you need to do um, 18 Instagram posts a month or whatever. Yeah. And then you start, yeah, exactly. start putting things like uh, today, great session with seven uh, O and, uh, and the 98, you know, and this, when I see this, I'm yeah. like, it's like, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like, like this thing of self-promoting, for example, I don't like this self-promoting because I think it's stupid, but, uh, but this has nothing to do with winter thing is the whole fucking society is like this now. No, even yeah, you can do it in a way because what you're doing in a way is also self-promoting. You're just doing it in a very different way. So there are ways to do it. Yeah, but I do, I do self, I do self promote. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Okay. But, uh, what I mean is like self-promoting just for self-promoting. This is what I sometimes have a bit of difficulty with. Like, uh, you know, it's like uh, in the end, there's so many codes in this, in this, uh, yeah, in this business system. Like you say, the, what sponsors expect from you and what you should be doing. It's, it's, there's a lot of uh, things you have to do and not do and all this and uh and this is pissing me off because i feel like we are in the end we are like sportsmen and what's most important is what we do in the water not how we promote ourselves you know um so yeah, and also your attitude so yeah, some, off the water i think it matters it matters a lot like i had this conversation with uh, craig and i asked him straight up like you choose writers of a certain personality. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but you know what? It's true. It's true. But I, I, I would just give you an example. Something probably nobody knows. Almost, I was on no sales when I was uh, nineteen, for one year. Like it was my. There was the. They were the first board of sales sponsor who gave me a good contract with good money and everything. Um, and then after one year, they wanted me to go to Fanatic uh not wanted but you know i was on taboo and basically was like oh you go to fanatic north oh and then taboo got together with gastra at this time so i had the choice and i chose to go to gastra and taboo because uh, taboo has a different philosophy you know so you can you can choose actually what you okay you see you say yeah the the fanatic team they're all like really they're really professional I would say, you know, they like the guys, they were the, the team clothes, the stickers perfect. They are really nice, sympathetic guys. Like, you know, you go to Adam, to uh, Adrien, they're super nice people. Like everyone, they're like, you know, they're not really, they would not be unfriendly to anyone. They're like nice people to be around and they know the job they're doing and they're doing. So they, they really fit this. And uh, I always felt like I'm not fitting this. So then I go, I'm not going there. That's it, you know? So I think it's, I, there's nothing to complain about this. It's just, uh, if you don't like it, then don't do it. Then go somewhere else and do something else, you know? That's how I see it. So, and, and that's why, it's not why, because taboo, is, for me, it's my life, you know? Since I have, I'm, I'm 12 years old, I'm riding taboo boards, and the boards are amazing, you know? And, uh, but also the philosophy of the brand, is about, uh, you know, never ever nobody in the taboo team told me, Thomas, you know what? Actually, you should, you should not uh, do this uh, in the party or you should not do that and you should not say this on internet and you should, you know, they, never, they trust me and they let me do what I do and they don't try to control anything. And uh, I think each brand has his own philosophy, you know, so you have to, you have to go, yeah, it's also what you are touching on about Bern with uh, Nash. That, yeah, obviously, when you talk with Matteo, you know, uh, Bern, for example, maybe he has a different philosophy than Nash and now he's not with them. Maybe he should have left earlier. I don't know. This is not my problem, you know. Yeah. But uh, we, are, we are not, we cannot all fit the same boxes because we have different forms, you know. So And exactly. And sometimes I, I really this, feel like, like this world you know they have this like you say in this new era there is this mold that this box that maybe they want us to fit in especially like on the racing side i think there is an idea 
you know, of yeah. how, how the guys are supposed to be. And then, you know, but if I look back to the golden times, it was not like that. You know, the guys had a lot of personality and a lot of, yeah. and even if this personality yeah. is there now, um, a lot you don't of people see are scared, it. That's, scared that's to show it. Close scared to show it you know because rather than putting a a, something that shows your personality you put like a nice session on seven eight and uh, and 118 or whatever you know just because you think okay my sponsors and this and that and i should be professional and whatever you know so yeah in my eyes it's actually detrimental to the sport because we sell like a package no it's why why people yeah. wanna wanna come to a windsurf event? Not because they wanna look at windsurfers doing forwards for the whole day in silt. It's because we're selling some sort of a lifestyle, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. A dream about, yeah. Yeah, they come yeah, to the beach in what, silt. You know they, they come to the beach in silt, but in mind they have Hawaii, they have the beach, they have the lifestyle, they have you know what I mean. So yeah, but but look, look, someone like Buzz Buzz Miller is uh is like not fitting any box, and people love him. That's so, what I mean. People know? love him. Yeah. People love him, but yeah, he had troubles. To I love I love him. People, but I I love him also. You know, yeah, I'm part but, of the people. But he had troubles to get sponsored. You know, until maybe two three sure. years ago. For sure. For sure, but but check where he is now. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if he is getting. I don't know. It's, I don't like to talk about money or anything, but but I think in the end it paid off, you know, because he's, he exactly did just what the fuck he wanted to do, you know. He never cared about nothing, and in the end, okay, maybe he had some tough years where he was like getting nothing from nobody, no support, just like some free sales, maybe or I don't know. But in the end, now he's a fucking legend, and the guy uh, he will be known for forever probably, and and he will in the end he will be able to make a living out of it probably more than most of the guys who try to fit in the box straight away. But and that's what I mean. I would much box. rather sports or bouts than somebody that is even you know top five, but you can't yeah, really. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, but you sponsor him now. You sponsor him now that he's successful. But uh, five years ago, nobody would sponsor him because people you know how the brands are. I mean, it's a business. A brand will say, okay, if I give uh, 10,000 euro to this guy, am I going to sell for 10,000 euro more of equipment? I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna get, am I going to get really the, back, the money back what I invested? No. So... And it was the same for me. I don't want to compare myself to him, but all this time I did all these trips and, you know, like, I, I don't want to present myself like a punk rock, whatever, rock star, whatever. But until I, the year I won the, my first event, I was still smoking ciggies in between the heat and I didn't give a fuck, you know, uh, about anything. Uh, and I was, and the, I, I was not trying to be something just because, you know, in the end I, did, I followed my way all the time and he brought me where I am. I'm like, I could have never imagined being here now, you know, I, but I think it's, uh, but this is the same in everything in life, you know, I think it's not some, nothing about windsurfing. If you check the surfing world, uh, just just think about when we were kids, you know, Andy Irons and uh, Tash Burrow and uh, I mean, there was a lot of crazy guys, the Hawaiian, you know, the punching, the pro Sonny Garcia punching the guys on the beach. They were crazy motherfuckers, but they, there was a lot of, wow, you know, personality, like you say, and now the surfers, they come out and they all make the same stupid interview. Like, yeah, yeah next hit, you know. Uh, but then you have someone like Mason Ho with a fucking lunatic and all of a sudden he's like, he had no sponsor almost for 10 years and now he's uh, probably the most popular surfer in the world. Yeah. But this is why I, I, I just don't get it because uh, it's but this sells, is society. It, it actually like, sells it no, but it sells much better. You know what I mean? If yeah, if there was if there was like 15 of you and 10 of Baltz Muller and whatever, it would sell the sport much better. So why go away 
from what is actually successful. Like you say, like the surfers, you know, uh, it's because it's risky because it's risky because at the beginning you, you're not getting nothing, you know, you take a risk. You're like, you know, I had, I, I just to give you an example. I remember I had this talk with Matt Pritchard, who was team manager for Gastra. Uh, I think this was 2000, I would say 2009, something like, yeah, 2009, the year I finished fifth. That was my first year where I was successful in the ways. And I remember I had this talk in Zilt with him and he was telling me, he was like, fuck Thomas, you know, I think now it's the time, you know, now you have to get serious now because if you're not, it's now or never, you know, don't, don't miss the changes. Now you have to stop all your bullshit and start to train and all this thing, you know. And uh, I, was, I was looking at him and uh, I didn't get what he was saying because for me, it didn't make any sense. And, and I didn't do what he said, but in the end, I'm successful. And uh, because Matt, he, had, he is a different guy and he's, I, I, he's a super cool guy. I, I really have a good relationship with him now. Uh, but he's, he's totally different, you know, and he was working for the brand. So he was there to make sure that the money they were giving to riders, they were going to get it back. Not in five years, but the next year, you know? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and I think it's the same in, in every part of society. If you look at the artist in music industry or whatever, it's called an in industry, the music event. The real artists are not the one who, who produce this uh, stupid pop song who's going to be uh, the hit of the summer and then you don't hear them anymore, you know? They are the, the real one that you will remember. They are the one maybe for 10, 15, 20 years. You don't really know them. And, but they create this, really this base that they, in the end, they are, you know, they are what they are. They don't, they are not what that the producer is like, okay, you're going to dress like this, sing this song. I'm going to produce your song completely different because right now this is the trend. And you, you know what I mean? I know exactly uh, what you mean because um because i have these discu discussions all the time like uh that's something you know that there is this popular culture and then there is this kind of outside of that outside of the box but actually if something is really good from outside the box it will prevail and it will be successful and then it and will maybe the, become that's what the pop that's what the popular culture is going to get inspiration from in the end. On top. Yeah, that's what from I mean. From this you underground know? crazy thing. Because what was maybe but, unacceptable 10 years ago right now is the norm. And yeah. um, so, so it's weird that, that the sport has gone, you know, so much cleaner and so much more like sort of boring, you know? because maybe in music is the opposite you know like when i don't know when i was growing up it was the the grunge or whatever and nirvana and all these guys you know they looked like super bad yeah. boys now it's like uh, they're not even they wouldn't even you know they would be the nice guys in the room you know <laughs> you know what i yeah. mean so, yeah yeah yes and no because uh, yeah but, yeah but only because now it's trendy to be to be a bad boy you know, it's all about the trend. There's the trend. We are, we, it's a business, you know, we, it's about the image we give. Yeah. When you, when you produce a performance or music or something, there's expectations because the trend is this and people are like, uh, used to seeing something. And if it's something too different or too strong, maybe they don't, you know, they cannot take it so, so quickly. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think for me, this is a society debate, you know, like we live in a society, I think, where everything has to be clean uh, a little bit. But I don't know. Like, I think everybody just thinks differently. And, and just because I think that way maybe doesn't make it true. I just have this observation and I, I, and I think you have a similar one. So, so that's why I kind of, I think it's interesting. Okay, just to... Yeah. Just to end on a maybe a future Positive note. Positive note. Uh, I don't. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Um, you're 34, 35 this year. Uh, 34, yeah. I would not. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So where is where is Tomat Traversa in five, ten years time? 
I have no idea, really. I don't know. And that's the thing I never knew. So in the end, uh, the only thing I know is that pff, I will see, but I never planned anything. I never knew and so far it worked really well. It's just getting better, you know? I'm like more successful in what I do. I am my family. I am, you know, I have two girls now. My, my little daughter is gonna turn two next week. The big one is five and a half. I have uh, my own house with my wife. Uh, I don't, I don't care, you know, I will see, hopefully I'm still in surfing. I wish, I hope, I hope. We hope, because we get from time to time, we get an amazing video from you. So we definitely hope that. Yeah, I mean, I, I just hope people don't get tired of it. That's my dream. You know, if people don't get tired of it and I can continue doing this, like Jason, you know, he's like almost 50, the guy, I don't know, 45 <laughs> at least. Or... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, but, and uh, and he's he's still a fucking legend. So I I don't compare myself to him, you know. But uh, that would be my dream. Yeah, but maybe something completely different. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I don't really see myself working in the windsurfing industry because I'm not a marketing business guy. I think. So either I will keep, I would say, and that's that's only what I would think now, but maybe I'm totally wrong. Either I would keep riding or just uh, do something out of windsurfing, I think. Couple quick hitters to end it. What are your pet peeves? What is this? I had uh, the bad thing, no? No, what, Something what that's this like... Again? So like kind of pisses you off that um, you almost get like a physiological reaction, like, uh, you know, like what you really cannot, you see and straight away you are pissed off. Yeah, uh, I would say people uh, who are like too confident and too sure of what they think. Hmm. Uh, sounds like me. <laughs> How many times a day do you pee your wetsuit? Uh, when I, maybe once when I win surf, I don't know, once maybe. Okay. I don't make long sessions, so. Uh, your guilty pleasure. Uh, I'm trying to get rid of them, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, my guilty pleasure. Ah. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I would have say like, um, yeah, like addictions in general. Addictions. Not that I'm a fully drug addict, eh, but just addictions for everything. You know, I'm an addictive person. Yeah. Your top five windsurfers of all time. So, is it like wave or in general? Whatever you want to put, it's your your top five. Okay, so so I'm, it's not gonna be my top five, but if there was only five that I, I will uh, I could look at, you know, videos and pictures and uh, so Polaco for sure, uh, Josh Angulo for sure, Kaoli for sure. That's three. Uh, then uh, Prozinho because I think he's the best ever um, so that's four and uh, uh, Scott Carville there <laughs> <laughs> So he goes, he goes, he goes into the most underrated also category. Yeah, that was the next question, <laughs> for sure. Okay, so foil freestyle, yes or no? Foil freestyle? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. F freestyle for me is uh, has to be free. So yes, for mm -hmm. sure, yes. Obstacles and slalom racing, yes or no? Uh, it's not my business, so I don't care, but uh, 
No, I would say no because uh, we did the super super X discipline and I saw it this kind of sucked. So I would say no. One spot you'd have to sail every day for the rest of your life. Like alone, or if it's a crowded place, it doesn't matter. I can take off the crowd. <laughs> yeah, you can take off the crowd. <laughs> so, Ponta Preta. Okay, without the kiters. Without, but without the crowd. Without the crowd, huh? Yeah. Who is your worst competitor? Um. Uh, yeah, um, I was thinking about this, but I think I would say Ricardo because I, I don't know. I, it's, I always have a hard time competing against him, Ricardo. Yeah. But I, I beat him in Pozo, so that, that's my. I think that's the only time I ever beat him in my life, and that was in Pozo. So I'm happy about it. Yeah, quite <laughs> a few freestyle hits, I guess, back in the day. One yeah, movie that I lost, yeah. <laughs> One movie everyone should see. Uh, one movie, a windsurfing movie, or in general? Whatever, general. General. Um, I don't know. Madagascar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who would you want to hear on the podcast? Bushma. Okay, that could be interesting, actually. <laughs> okay, that's that wraps it up. Thank you so much, Thomas. A lot of insight. You're welcome. Hopefully, yeah, a little bit of psychotherapy for me to talk about me so much. Sorry. <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, it's good. That was nice. It's good. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. A lot of stuff I actually didn't know, so so that's good. And if I don't know it, I, I don't think many people know. So yeah. <laughs> yeah anyway, enjoy good. your time. Have a good recovery, and um, looks like uh, we might be able to travel again soon. So let's see see how it goes. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, but no stress. And yeah, I hope you can you can compete in slalom. No, you still have a chance. No, maybe for some events. Something. I think you guys might have Maui as well. Ah, uh, yeah, that would be that would be good. That would be good. World Championship. One, actually, one event. Boom. Yeah, but you know, you know what? It's like even if it would be weird. I was thinking about this today. You know, in the Olympics, people win or lose a ti Olympic title. It's like just in one single event every four years yeah so i don't think it would be really unfair to have just one event for world title i agree i agree fully yeah and i'm oh. yeah okay i'm gonna let you go yeah Take care. good night thank you good see you <laughs> thanks bye ciao Thanks for watching. Yeah, you made it to the end. Of course you did. Some crazy stories in there and probably the most open and honest podcast we have had for sure. Uh, I think these podcasts are going down pretty well, I would say, with the hardcore windsurfing community. So it's really good to have you guys supporting. Uh, obviously, if you want to support the channel with a few beers, we've added this as extra to all the stuff we've ever done. So it's squeezing, it's squeezing. So if you do want to support the channel, you're loving the content, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 quid, anything you want to put in, in the beer money would help uh, support those boys. Like I said, we can uh, give Matt Check a few beers as well because he is doing an amazing job. Uh, as always, tell us in the comments who you want to uh, be on the podcast next. We've got a couple of big names lined up and probably one of the best all round ever windsurfers in the world coming up.
And it's not a bloke. It's not a bloke. Yes, there we go. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel uh, if you don't want to miss. And obviously, it is available audio only on Spotify and iTunes. And it can be one of the best travel companions, these, uh, uh, these podcasts. I've been loving them. Uh, there we go. Thumbs up, like if you liked it. And I'll stick the other podcasts up there.